Hi everyone, it's Kelly from The Hub, here today with Dr. Silverstein from uh, Ephrata Wellspan Hospital. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was thinking about a lot of other things. How are you, Dr. Scott? Great, thank you, Kelly. How are you? Excellent. So, um, Dr. Scott, of course, is the expert on all things vaping. Um, he's not going to say that he is, but he is. Um, so, we wanted to talk today about how vaping affects your body physically. So let's look at it first. So this is aerosol that goes into your lungs. So let's talk about your lungs first. And as a pulmonologist, this is your forte. So how does this stuff affect what's going on in your lungs? When someone vapes, there's always a heater core and that heating core heats up a liquid, which then delivers a substance, typically nicotine, into the lungs. But what happens is when that heating core heats up and you aerosolize in this vapor, what happens is it can pull up chemicals. And, it, and the chemicals in the vapor itself can be generated from the metals that are actually in the vaping devices themselves. So the things that are in uh, uh, an aerosol that people breathe in over and over have shown to not be as many at all compared to cigarettes, uh, which have over 7,000 different toxic chemicals in them. But the aerosol in a vapor has certain things in it that can be quite, quite potentially damaging. Uh, number one is what they call volatile organic compounds. And these include things like organic chemicals, such as acetaldehyde and formaldehyde. You know, these are things that are in nail polish. These are in things in your, in your drywall. Uh, but again, we are aerosolizing them in, and they have cancer-causing properties out, you know, that we are aware of. How much they do in terms of the vaping, we don't know yet, because vaping's only really been around and in vogue from around 2007. So there's just not a lot of long-term data yet but there are volatile organic compounds. There are heavy metals, including tin and nickel and lead, as well as cadmium and mercury that can be aerosolized in. Um, and so uh, again, the other thing that's in them, uh, there, when everybody um, vapes, they basically have to vape a, a, what they call a humectant. And a humectant is a thickened material that allows you to basically keep it all in the same area and, and aerosolize it in. And the, the two humectants that are in, one is called propylene glycol and the other is vegetable glycerin. And although they're not known to cause any acute effects, we don't know long-term what they will do. Uh, and so again, the other chemical that's out there, a lot of people know about flavorings and all the flavorings that people have, have, have uh, breathed in with, with vaping. Well, a lot of the flavorings are all uh, put in a substance called diacetyl. And diacetyl is a chemical compound that goes into a vaping through an aerosol to help with the flavorings and, and, and basically to make the flavorings taste a certain way. And we do know that diacetyl has been associated with popcorn lung uh, and other illnesses actually directly causing lung injury. And I guess the most important thing to talk about would be back about a year and a half ago, the term Evali, e-cigarette or vapor associated lung injury. Yeah. And it was an acute lung injury that, that got about 3,000 people sick and caused about 60 plus deaths. And this was all due to vitamin E oil, vitamin E acetate oil that was used in vaping devices, in, in bootlegged or street bought vaping devices, mostly with THC or the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. These were bootleg devices that put that stuff in it to help thicken up the smoke. And people were aerosolizing this into their lungs. And if you, Kelly, were to take vitamin E tablets, right. I do. or use vitamin E ointment, it's fine. Right. But when you aerosolize it in, it can cause very profound, severe lung injury. I think that that was the thing that freaked people out because you know your doctor might say you need to have you need to take vitamin e for you know whatever the thing is or right topically you put it on your skin because it it, it does lovely things so i think people thought well duh i can take vitamin e for other things why is this bad because 
breathing it is very different than taking it orally or using it topically. And I think that that's, I mean, if like, especially the vegetable oil stuff that you talked about before, people are like, well, it's vegetable oil. Well, A, not really. And you also don't breathe that into your lungs. So it's a very, just changing the method that you take it in changes all of the stuff. What, how did that, how did that vitamin E like, what does it do to your lungs? Like, when that was, when that was, like, the, st when everybody was talking about that, what did that actually do to your lungs? It caused something called acute lung injury. Uh, in other words, when they did um, studies on these individuals, they lavaged them, they kind of washed out their airways, and they did biopsies. And what they found that kind of connected them to this particular vitamin E substance was they found it actually in the lavage of their lungs and in biopsies. Oh. And it's not 100%. There are some people that did not have this. Um, actually, not everybody, only about 80 to 90% of the cases were related to uh, THC, but there were 10% that only had nicotine alone. And again, not everyone universally was vitamin E acetate oil. So what we know is that when the vaping devices are cut, with different types of oils or different types of resins to thicken the smoke and, and to thicken the vape. The bottom line is that particular stuff, when aerosolized in, actually causes an acute lung injury that causes a leakage of fluid into the lungs and lung damage. Wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty clear. That's clear. And, the biz and the bizarre thing, the really unusual thing, unfortunately, it's not as big a deal, but the symptoms of this illness, Evali, the most common symptoms are shortness of breath, cough, fever, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Does that sound a lot like anything else? Oh, for heaven's sakes. So, so the question, a lot of it was how much is COVID and how much could be these kids vaping? And, right. and one of the things that I was most interested in over the last year, at least since February and March, was does vaping play any role with COVID? Or is there any connection, you know, between them? And if there was not really much known on this up until the end of August, when a really neat study came out in the Journal of Adolescent Health um, out of Stanford yeah. and University of California, San Francisco. And it was a really cool study because what they found was that vapors, okay, people that vape had a seven times higher likelihood of contracting COVID-19 virus than people who did not vape. And of those who vaped, the ones who vaped and had the virus, they had at least a two to three times more likelihood of having a much more severe case just because of vaping. And what was, what was the reason for that? Because- That's a really good question. Like, were their lungs used to the aerosolness? Like, how does it, how does it do that? No, that's a really good question. There was a theoretical idea, and it makes a lot of sense. We have certain receptors in our airways and our lungs. They're called ACE, angiotensin converting enzymes 2. And this is a certain receptor that's in the airways and the lungs. And we know that COVID-19 requires that receptor to gain entrance eat more easily into our airways and into the lungs. So what they feel is the people that vape it triggers these receptors to basically get inflamed and allow the virus to have a better place to come in and launch to. Wow. So wow. Are, That's a huge deal. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that causal connection, I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, A, this isn't good anyway to do this. And we've talked about, you know, why people have vaped before and all that stuff. But knowing that, the vaping can cause that receptor to then go and then be yeah. like open in my work, in my head, it's like they're open because they're like inflamed. Right. And then, so then mm -hmm. anything that falls on them there, cause they're bigger, they can just absorb all the funk. That's correct. And also there are these little hair cells in the airways called cilia. And yeah. cilia which are these, these little float, these little flapping little hair cells that help protect us from foreign bodies and help protect the lungs. Well, vaping and cigarettes can both damage the cilia and again, make it more easily 
for viral particles to land and to also propagate. So there's a lot of different factors involved, but the interesting part to me was not many younger people were, were getting that sick uh, with, with, with COVID-19. Right. What I wondered, and I think this article tends to prove it, is that the younger people that do get sick, what may be connecting those people is the fact that they're either smoking or vaping. And, and we'll see as time goes on because it takes time and it takes cases to be able to show whether or not it's more causally related or less causally related. So we'll see yep. over time how that sort of works out. So I, I also wanted to talk about like the big other, th other thing that's in vaping is the nicotine. So we've talked about how it how all this stuff affects your lungs and the biggest chemical of course that's in this is nicotine so what does nicotine how does nicotine affect you physically and why is it why is it a big deal because of vaping that's a great question um 99 of all vaping devices have nicotine um and that's really important because tobacco companies know that the more nicotine that you get the kids particularly to use, the more they're gonna become physically and psychologically addicted. Nicotine is the most uh, addictive substance that's really out there that we know of. It has more addictive potential than heroin, cocaine, alcohol. Um, and what we do know is that you, the, the, as I said, I think I mentioned last time, the most, the, the most popular vaping device, which still is Juul, each pod that kids use or adults use is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. Right. Um, one of the biggest problems that we see, especially at a younger age, is that teens, particularly that vape, have a seven times higher likelihood of transitioning to cigarettes than if you don't vape. And again, the reason for that is because the need for higher and higher levels of nicotine. What a lot of adults do and kids have started to do is it's called dual usage. And what they will actually do is both vape and smoke cigarettes as well, which will actually significantly increase the amount of nicotine leading to significantly increased substance abuse and, and addiction. Uh, the bottom line is this is all about addiction, 100%. So when you say, you know, that concept of Nancy Reagan, just say no, yeah. you know, or just stop, it's foolhardy because it is a absolute, it's an addiction, there is withdrawal. And the bottom line is when you talk to administrators at schools, and I think we discussed this a little bit, these kids can't get through the day without vaping because they're addicted to nicotine. And that's the issue. It's not because at this point they wanna be vaping, it's at this point they have to be vaping. And the more that they use, the more that they need. You, you talk about physiologically, and what can nicotine do? Well, we know that the developing brain is developing up until the age of about 25. We know that nicotine can directly affect learning, memory, and attention. All three of those things. Well, you think teachers care about that with students? Just a little. Maybe you're a teacher. I think you would remember that. So right. when kids are having troubles with memory, learning, and attention, it doesn't lead to cohesive classroom situations or kids learning or becoming successful. So again, this is something that can absolutely lead to long-term poverty uh, because of, again, having troubles with going through the educational system and getting an adequate education. And so again, there's long-term ramifications of this. Nicotine can elevate your blood pressure. It can elevate your heart rate. It can cause uh, cerebral vascular disease. Um, it, you know, it, it can be associated with so many different things but the biggest thing we worry about is getting kids addicted. Right, because then, <laughs> then you have to get kids into a program or into recovery in order to be able to get off of it. And because it's so addictive, you can flip back so easily. I, I, I will just say this, my mother quit smoking just before I was born and about 35 years later, I was sitting in, I was sitting outside with her after just finishing a lovely meal at, at a, a, a barbecue. And she looked at me and she said, wow, I could have a cigarette right now. And she hadn't smoked in 35 years. And I looked at her and I went, 
what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> like, I was like, what? what? <laughs> and she said, you have no idea. And I thought, ma. And I know that like addiction is, can also be, you know, a fluid sort of continuum, but I never thought that after that much time, she would be, feel that strongly. And she totally did. And it was bothersome to me. The, the terms that we use are wanting, needing, and craving. And, and the bottom line is when nicotine receptors in the brain are triggered, and there are millions and millions and millions that are triggered, um, that wanting, needing, and craving for some people never goes away. So years and years down the road, if they are in a stressful situation, as we all are every day of almost every day of our lives, all that it has to do is trigger that stress and every fiber, every neuroreceptor in the brain starts triggering for nicotine, even though it's years down the road. Wow. So, and some people, it affects far more than others. Yeah. Some people, once they stop, it's their end. They don't, they don't ever think about it again. And other people like alcohol or in, you know, in my situation, food, you, know, you always want it. Yeah, yeah. So one last question, because this is something that people think about all the time with cigarettes, and I want to make sure that, we're, that we clear this up with vaping. People talk about, so one of the things with cigarettes is, you know, you can get throat cancer, you can get lip cancer, you can get gum cancer, you can, of course, get lung cancer. So is cancer an issue with vaping? Um, we're not aware of that yet. Uh, again, because generally the amount of cancer-causing agents in cigarettes are far, far, far uh, uh, in increased in number compared to what's in vaping. Um, it's not even close. So in that respect, you know, vaping is always felt to be a little bit safer than cigarettes, but we literally don't know because it's just too early in the process. Um, there's a theoretical, but not a definite. Again, uh, I, I think overall, what's in there is a lot safer than cigarettes, but, but not clearer. The, the issue, to go back to something that you just brought up, sure. is the issue of how do we treat those kids? Are we going to discuss that down the road? Yes, we are. Absolutely. Okay, because yeah. that's a whole different issue yep. as far as what to do with the nicotine withdrawal in children yeah. and adolescents. So to answer your question again, it's just the bottom line is this was a... The, the first vaping device was 2004. The first marketing of them was around 2007 in China. So we really didn't start even majorly producing these in the United States till about 2010. So it's just way too early to see the long-term effects of these things. That's good because, yeah, I don't want anybody, any of the viewers to be like, oh, look, now I can do it. Yeah, that's not mm. what we're saying. Mm. We're saying no, we don't know. Yet. We don't know. This has been very, very helpful today. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. This has been great, and we will chat again. Thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye.